What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Termical Topics Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and this is my review of AEW Dynamite, which took place November 1st in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, now, this show was something else, for lack of a better word. Uh, there were a lot of comedic aspects of this show, some that were actually very good, but at the very same time, some comedic aspects that were not meant to be comedic and very frightening, uh, whether it was uh, a huge announcement from Tony Khan or a uh, Chris Jericho surprise reveal that we're going to get to. I don't know what was more disappointing. Uh, was it A, Tony Khan's announcement, which we thought was going to be much bigger uh, and much more significant? And then B, uh, Chris Jericho revealing his surprise partner. Um, we thought we were going to get something juicy from that, and that ended up turning into an internet meme and uh, the butt of all jokes, too. So there was uh, something to note that actually is a huge announcement, like it or not, a big surprise, if you will, that should have been mentioned on Dynamite that we found out the next day, Thursday afternoon. Uh, we come to find out uh, that there was a huge AEW press release in regards to the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, the legend uh, Ric Flair signs a multi-year deal with AEW. The Nature Boy's new Wu Energy was announced as the exclusive energy drink of AEW. Of course, this was dated on November 2nd, 2023. AEW CEO Tony Khan announced a multi-year deal with Hall of Famer Nature Boy Ric Flair, who surprised fans in attendance and viewers at home during last week's episode of AEW Dynamite uh, live from Philadelphia, marking his historic return to TBS by appearing as Khan's special gift for the icon Sting. Now, Flair's AEW debut comes on the heels of his longtime friend Sting's impending retirement announcement, which will culminate with the Icon's final match at AEW Revolution in 2024. Over the course of their 30-year history, Flair and Sting have shared incredible rivalries, momentous matches, and a respected friendship. Khan also announced that Flair's Wu Energy will become the exclusive energy drink of AEW. During AEW show dates, select host venues will carry the clean energy drink at concession stands for fans to enjoy. In addition, the beverage will be stocked in the wrestlers' locker rooms and will also be seen on the announcer's desk during live broadcasts. Fans watching at home can experience Woo Energy by ordering via WooEnergy.com. Now that's Woo with five O's. And I found that out a couple of weeks ago that the official uh, trademarked Woo, uh, Ric Flair mentioned, is five O's. I thought it was three for the longest time, but it's five. Um, so that's that. Last Wednesday, the Nature Boy made his epic return again to TBS more than 35 years since the Flair vs. Sting rivalry first began on the Superstation, said Khan. It's truly an honor to welcome the legend himself and Woo Energy to AEW. Rick cemented his legacy as one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time long ago, and now his world-renowned persona and his amazing wrestling mind will be major asset, will be a major asset uh, to AEW's programming and our position globally. Most importantly, it's fitting that the final chapter of Sting's iconic career will unfold on TBS with Ric Flair by his side. I've been in the wrestling business for over 50 years, said Flair. Together with AEW and Woo Energy, I've never been more excited and I've never had more energy. Uh, when the Nature Boy promises a show, you know how it's going to go. Uh, followed by a Woo. We've all been part of a Woo moment. Time stops, crowds erupt, and people unite to celebrate the extraordinary. It's electric. You hear it, you feel it, and never forget it, said Chad Bronstein president and chairman of Karma Hold uh, Company, parent company of Wu Energy. This is so much more than a partnership. Together, Ric Flair, AEW, and everyone at Wu Energy will create more unforgettable moments for generations of wrestling fans. And that was the entirety of the press release. Uh, pretty lengthy, so thanks for sticking around with me and uh, checking that out. So Ric Flair, part of AEW, what a very big surprise. You know, we thought on last week's episode of AEW Dynamite, uh, showing up being the special gift uh, for Sting by Tony Khan, uh, finding out that he, he wants to ride uh, this one out with Sting until his uh, impending retirement come Revolution 2024, which is in March, I believe. And um, so he's actually signed with AEW in some capacity. And look, do not be surprised if you see more of Ric Flair, not just there in the sense of uh, for this Woo Energy drink, or just being by the side of Sting, but I think we're going to see uh, more of Ric Flair than we'd even like to see or like to admit uh, over time. Now, this is a report via PW Insider. Uh, after the news of Ric Flair signing with AEW, Ric Flair stated that he has received clearance from his doctor with regards to taking bumps and performing in the ring. Now, look, Ric Flair is 74, and... I think I could speak for everybody here, even the biggest of Ric Flair fans, Nature Boy Ric Flair, right? Uh, nobody wants to see him in the ring wrestling uh, for, for numerous reasons. I mean, for let's just start for his own health and well-being. It's great to see him. It's When his music hits every time, I love it. Comes out, cuts a promo, 
does a couple chops as he even chopped Sting last week, half jokingly. And that's about it. You know, at, at this point in time, just like when we hear the Undertaker's theme music, we love seeing them. There's no need to see an Undertaker or Ric Flair wrestle anymore. And, and Ric Flair is significantly older uh, than the Undertaker. So seeing this, I can't say this report surprises me. But at the very same time, I'm hoping this doesn't mean that Sting's final opponent at Revolution 2024 uh, is going to be Ric Flair. I'd much rather see it be a Darby Allen or somebody along the lines of uh, somebody that is towards, you know, going into the future, right? The future of the wrestling business or AEW specifically. Darby would be the perfect candidate uh, to be going up against Sting. I mean, he's been by Sting's side since day one uh, when Sting pretty much debuted December 20 uh, of 2020 at Winter is Coming. And so that's that. Now, one more thing before I get into this AEW Dynamite review here. This comes from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Uh, now, this is talking about Brian Danielson and the injury that he sustained on AEW Dynamite a little over a week ago in that match where it was him and Claudio going up against the likes of uh, Okada and uh, Orange Cassidy. So it, it was said that uh, the show previous to AEW Dynamite, Saturday Night AEW Collision, where Andrade went up against Brian Danielson in that match. It said that Andrade's head accidentally hit Brian Danielson in the eye area during their match. Danielson actually had a black eye when he did that match uh, on October the 25th. Now, there was an attempt to keep that quiet because it basically tells you that Brian Danielson wrestled that match just a few nights later in Philadelphia on AEW Dynamite going into that with a broken orbital bone, and the decision was made to then uh, do an angle of him getting hurt in that match. At the end of that match, it was kind of bizarre where you saw Danielson uh, on the edge of the apron with the likes of Moxley, Willer Yuta, even Claudio Castagnoli was there. And uh, trying to see what was going on. At what point in time did he get so significantly injured? Is this real life? Is it a shoot? Is it a work of some sort? And uh, it looked more real than fake. And it certainly was. They just put it on hold for a few more days. And so he's out for the remainder of this year, it seems. And uh, so speedy recovery to Brian Danielson. He's had some rough luck, not just the past couple of months, but the past couple of years. Uh, basically, his tenure with AEW, uh, trying to remain healthy. He's had quite a few injuries that he sustained. Uh, since joining the company in fall of 2021. All right, so now let's get to this review of AEW Dynamite, again, taking place on November the 1st. Uh, the show opens up with a recap of last week's main event between Okada and Orange Cassidy versus Claudio Castanoli and Brian Danielson, as I was just referring to. Uh, Claudio Castanoli says there'll be no holding back later tonight, uh, leading into their match for the International Championship. And uh, then we got to see a recap of Collision's main event uh, this past Saturday between Kenny Omega and MJF. Great match as well. And MJF says, none of them are on the level of the devil. So he's got a great point. I mean, just let's just take a moment to think uh, who MJF has defeated in the last couple of months. All right, we'll take it back as recent as AEW All In in London in August. He defeated Adam Cole in the main event of that. Then just, what, three, four weeks later at Dynamite Grand Slam, Queens, New York. In September, he then goes on to defeat Samoa Joe in the main event of that. And then here we are. Uh, the most recent episode of AEW Collision, and he defeats Kenny Omega in the main event of that. So, I mean, it's unbelievable what MJF has accomplished uh, just the last couple of months, never mind the last year. It's, he's coming up on one year as AEW World Champion since full gear of last year, last November. Uh, so, man, just what an awesome resume and list of names that he's been able to defeat and just take on. Uh, throughout his AEW tenure, namely the past year as AEW World Champion. So now MJF is backstage with Renee Paquette. MJF has a list of the roster that he's going to go over to find three tag team partners uh, for later in the night to go up against the uh, Bullet Club Gold that aren't a-holes. And he chats with Adam Cole via satellite. Cole is glad he's the longest reigning and greatest AEW World Champion, and it kills him that he can't be there tonight at AEW Dynamite for him. He says Max should at least consider Samoa Joe's offer. And MJF doesn't know because Joe almost broke his neck the last time they wrestled. Again, uh, AEW Dynamite, a Grand Slam in Queens. MJF promises to defend the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships for him at full gear, uh, then leaves. Roderick Strong and the Kingdom roll up, and Roddy criticizes Max until Adam has had enough and then shuts off the TV. Uh, the screen flashes a brief image of that man in the devil mask, that infamous uh, MJF devil mask. Who is it? The mystery remains. And then we saw something similar uh, last week as well and in the recent past as far as that mask flashing uh, right around the time of an MJF segment. So uh, sooner than later, we're going to find out who it is. So many names have been thrown into that mix. Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly. Could it be uh, 
uh, Dolph Ziggler when he signs with the company. Um, well, we'll have to see. Could it be Britt Baker, right, with this whole elaborate plan? She never really liked MJF and the friendship that uh, her her Adam Cole had with MJF. So we'll see. But then uh, after that, this jumps right into the opening bout, the AEW International Championship. Uh, two-time uh, AEW International Champion Orange Cassidy putting his title on the line at the start of the show like we've seen so many other episodes of Dynamite during his first reign going up against the Blackpool Combat Club's Claudio Castanoli. Now we're jumping in a few minutes into this match. We see Hook and Wheeler Yuta uh, that are both ringside here exchanging words. Referee Bryce Remsburg ejects both of them, sends them backpacking. Uh, now we see a fireman's carry from Claudio Castanoli to Orange Cassidy. Castanoli takes him up top and Cassidy wakes up with elbows to the back of the neck. Jockeying for position here, Claudio blocks the sunset flip, power bomb, and lifts him back up by the ears. This was a brutal spot. I said he is lifting OC up like he's nothing. And don't get me wrong, I know Claudio is strong, but he lifted OC up like he was uh, some kind of inflatable doll or something like that. It was ridiculous. So he lifts him up by the ears, then hits a deadlift, delayed vertical suplex. Castanelli tosses OC into the turnbuckle and lays shoulder blocks in his commentary. Shows us Yuta and Hook now having a confrontation uh, backstage, where we then see Pat Buck had to break them up. And Hook even put his hands on Pat Buck, uh, which uh, raised an eyebrow there. Claudio then puts Orange in the corner. Cassidy posts him. A drop kick puts him into the post a second time, and he crashes to the floor. Suicide dive. Tornado DDT connects. Then once back in the ring, Orange perches, diving, caught, and Castanoli reverses. He reversed it again for a stun dog millionaire. Claudio hits the giant swing. I love seeing when he does that. Never gets old. Uh, Stepping through into the sharpshooter in the middle of the ring. Uh, Cassidy then crawling, struggling. Castanoli walks him right back into the center of that ring uh, where I thought this one was over. Sits in the hold for a little bit. Orange obviously struggling, uh, fighting his instinct to tap, trying to post on his arms. He rolls to the back, uh, to his back, punches, but Claudio goes right back to it. Transitioning into a cross face, rolling through, and he holds onto it, shifting into an arm trap, neck crank. Orange fights out, but Castanoli is right on him with a huge European uppercut. Uh, there were so many times where I thought Claudio was going to be the new champion. And again, I was was not opposed to Claudio winning this, then stirring up some trouble between him and uh, former stablemate, uh, current stablemate, uh, being that John Moxley, who lost that title to Ray Phoenix, unfortunately, uh, back in September. So overhead elbows, Orange gets away. Orange punch staggers Claudio then, and he manages to get him up for the beach break. Castanoli rolls out of the ring. Uh, taking nearly the full count of 10, he rolls back in. Uh, to break the count, obviously. Uh, then Cassidy steps up with his lazy kicks. Of course, what would the match be without that? Orange punch blocked back and forth. Orange fights through it. Up for the Swiss death. Cassidy briefly balances on his shoulders. And long story short here, folks, Orange Cassidy ends up winning with a victory roll, retaining his AEW International Championship. And uh, will this be a lengthy reign, uh, much like his first one, the better part of 10 months, his first International Championship reign? Actually, it was just a little over 10 and a half months. Uh, so we'll see. I think uh, Moxley will get to him sooner than later. And speaking of which, post-match, John Moxley makes his entrance, then proceeds to beat Orange Cassidy down in the ring. Claudio watches the beatdown take place. That's until security runs down to break it all up. And then he helps John clear the ring so he can get back to beating Orange Cassidy up. Castanoli pulls Moxley off of OC after a few more punches. Moxley then rolls out of the ring, heads backstage, and Moxley wants that international championship back. And I think he'll get it sooner than later, probably... Uh, at AEW Full Gear, if I had to guess. So now we're looking at MJF again backstage, looking for tag team partners for his match later in the night, uh, that four-on-four -four match. He knocks on Kenny Omega's door, but uh, to no avail. Who answers? But uh, Chris Jericho, one half of, what do they call themselves, the Golden uh, Jets these days? MJF asks if Kenny's in there, and Chris slams the door in MJF's face. Uh, he is suddenly then confronted by Wardlow, uh, choking him and putting him up against the wall, saying that he's going to take what's his when he least expects it. Now, following up on that great Wardlow video package that we saw last week that I was a huge fan of, one of my favorite parts of Dynamite last week that wasn't a wrestling match for sure, and uh, he voiced his frustrations as he did, you know, last week. He voiced it to Max live and in person. So I love this side of Wardlow for the second consecutive week. Hope it continues, and I really hope it goes somewhere for him. Uh, that's the one thing that's been lacking as far as his creative direction is concerned this last couple of years. So finally, the acclaimed, namely Max Caster, were lurking around the corner, uh, telling MJF that they could team with him, uh, but that didn't work out as it's been unsuccessful. These attempts for weeks now uh, for Max Caster, it's just the way he's been approaching it. Uh, so Bowens and Billy Gunn visibly frustrated with Max Caster for being too eager and a bit of a creep. I think we don't we could all agree to that as he's been this entire time with MJF, whether it's on his Twitter timeline 
or obviously in person on Dynamite, on Collision, and so on and so forth. So then we see uh, John Moxley backstage. Obviously, this was shortly thereafter of him beating Orange Cassidy up in the center of that ring post-match. Uh, Mox says Ray Phoenix kamikaze himself to put him down for three seconds, and OC swept in and took his match from him. He says he showed Orange respect when no one else would, and now he's writing him off like everyone else. He's sick of him, like he's sick of everyone, and maybe it's not even him, but he's going to beat him within an inch of his life at full gear, just because he can. I do believe that's going to happen, even if OC gets some good offense in here. I do think the bottom line here is this. Orange Cassidy will drop to John Moxley. He's going to get his title back. Let's look at the bright side here. He'll then be a, a two-time international champion, much like OC, even though John's first reign was a joke. It was only a couple weeks due to that concussion and whatever took place at Dynamite Grand Slam, losing the Ray Phoenix. And so hopefully, for Moxley's sake, he could get back on track with his winning ways, especially leading into the month of December and uh, early 2024. So we had an ROH six-man championship match. And when I tell you I cannot wait to go over this for numerous reasons, I want to go over the match into itself and then everything after the fact as to why this initial title change back at uh, Rampage Grand Slam in Queens, New York, back in late September, was such a pointless move. So let's just start here. We have the Mogul Embassy looking to regain their titles. Again, Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony going up against uh, the Elite, right? Hangman Adam Page, the Young Bucks, the Hung Bucks, call them whatever you want. So starting off with this match here, we have Adam Page and Bishop Khan to start. Uh, Hangman putting boots to him in the corner. The other two come in. The Bucks even the odds here. Bishop to the apron. Triangle Lariat sends him crashing to the floor. Now we're back inside the ring here. Standing switches back into the babyface corner. Tagged to Matt Jackson. Double teams into a cannonball senton. Elite were holding court. Tagged to Nick Jackson. Senton Atomico in the ropes. Cover for two. We go to a break. Page ducks a Lariat from Leona. Cactus closed lines. Back inside. Powerbomb on Khan. Lining book shot up. Swerve Strickland then comes down, mic in hand, asking whose house this is and reminding Hangman Adam Page that he was at his house just last week. Obviously, Page not feeling that. Uh, Page tags Nick in and gives chase to Strickland backstage and Prince Nana. Headed to the back again. Uh, so we have Nick Jackson fighting hard against all three members of the Mogul Embassies. Toa throws him into the ropes. Low bridge, super kick to Brian Cage. Uh, one for Bishop Khan as well. Brian drops him with a lariat. Suplex from the apron inside. Matt Jackson runs in. Trading punches, but the numbers game overwhelms them. Matt gets put down with a double power bomb and thrown to the floor. Picking Nick Jackson up. Triple power bomb. Roll into a knee strike. Gates of Agony with a double face buster. Get the pin. Get the win. And most importantly get their titles back. Now, man, again, there's so much to unpack here. Uh, where to begin? So they retain, or they didn't retain, they got back their Ring of Honor World Six-Man Tag Team Championships that they lost just five or six weeks ago um, to the Elite, who then became two-time champions, last time winning it in 2017 when they were active members of Ring of Honor. I've asked this question a couple times. I think even the most recent uh, review of AEW Dynamite, have they even been on a recent episode of Ring of Honor? I would genuinely like to know, really. Anyway, happy to see they got their tag titles back. I really am. They never should have lost them in the first place, and I'm about to tell you why. So, let's start off with the simple fact that they were well on their way to being champions for the better part of a year, with their initial run, obviously, until they lost in late September at a Rampage Grand Slam. At that moment in time, uh, the Mogul Embassy were champions for 284 days. 284 days. L now, let me just preface this by saying these titles have been around since 2016. I believe there's been about 14 or 15 champions, uh, but at this very moment in time, their reign ended as the third longest reign for those titles history. Now, the number one spot is at 405 days, uh, the ones who hold that record are Mexi Squad, and number two is at 295 days, and that is held by Shane Taylor Promotions. And as a matter of fact, that was a record that was from I want to say 2021 at some point. And ironically enough, Bishop Khan uh, was part of that title reign as well before joining the Mogul Embassy. So he had, uh, he's, you know, got the number two record on lock regardless, at least as far as he's concerned. So that's cool. I didn't know that going into this. Uh, so you mean to tell me that, you know, the Mogul Embassy were only 11 days away uh, from tying the number two all time record and just 12 days away from becoming the actual number two uh, of all time title holders. They were a week and a half away. And you decided to have the elite win these titles on a pointless episode of Rampage Grand Slam. 
for no particular reason at all, just to hold them, just to say they got another title reign, right? Add to their list of accolades and achievements for the better part of five, six weeks, and then to just lose them on a, a regular old episode of Dynamite uh, this past week. It doesn't seem to make very much sense when they could have really uh, made history here, right? Instead of being stuck at number three, they could have tied or, or became the number two spot for the all-time list here for the Mogul Embassy. So that, that's a real head-scratcher to me. That's one of the many things. And the other head-scratcher here is if they would have uh, just held on to those titles as they did in late September and continued uh, with this title reign, not only would they be well on their way to holding these titles for one year, at this very moment in time, they'd be upwards of 330 days uh, had they not stopped at 284. And so never mind even you know solidifying their place as number two on the list, they now are well on their way to knocking out the number one position that is at 405 days. And that's very attainable. And if you are familiar with the Mogul Embassy and these three gentlemen, it's very believable uh, that they could hold these titles for 405, 406 days, uh, becoming number one on the list. It's a very believable group. I mean, look how quickly they won them back. They got this title opportunity and they they made sure they uh, they made it happen. You could blame, you know, Swerve for coming out distracting the elite that's why hangman adam page went backstage to justify uh the elite dropping quote unquote it was just the mogul embassy against the young bucks here and so you had a uh, three on two and so the numbers game came into play and that's why they won sure you can make that argument and i I get that point well taken bottom line here is it was still a pointless title reign five weeks what are we doing here these guys would have been in the number two position and they would have been well on their way to becoming number one knocking out knocking out mexico squad Uh, in the foreseeable future so it's just stupid to me now their title reign starts all the way at scratch again and even let's just say let's say all three members of the mogul embassy don't care let's just say that they don't care about what their place is one two three on the list they're still at three and hey they made the top three they would have had two would have been well on their way to one whatever they're two-time champs and i do get that right but uh there was no creative plan. And I think that's the bigger issue here. Why do you do such a significant title change ending a reign of 284 days that were just 11, 12 days away from becoming uh, the number two all time leader just for the elite to take these out on a couple of random opportunities of dynamite or, you know, um, rampage to defend them. And then just to end up dropping them, and it's just silly to me. You still have this Swerve Strickland, Hangman Adam Page. They had a great match at Wrestle Dream the beginning of October. We're going to see part two at Full Gear. They're probably going to put on another phenomenal showing between the two. And you could have kept that rivalry and that feud going and brewing without these ROH titles going back and forth. It was so unnecessary. So that kind of stuff bothers me. Because if there's a plan and you're going to end a long title reign, you know, whether I don't care if it's tag title, singles title, whatever, by all means, do what you got to do. Pull the trigger, make it happen. But to make this switch just for them to win them back a little over a month later when they could have solidified themselves at the very top of the list or been well on their way and just show and prove their utter dominance because these are three big boys. And again, I've said it numerous times, in a, uh, whether I'm talking about Ring of Honor or AEW, I saw them twice over the summer in July live. And the Mogul Embassy, they are no joke. So I don't want to get caught up on this any longer than I already have. But just voicing my frustrations here because it was just so nonsensical to have them lose in the first place it was ridiculous so here we are uh we're backstage we then see security pulling swerve strickland and adam page apart and then they go back to the ringside area post-match and uh you see matt jackson of the young bucks visibly frustrated uh, by the end result dropping those trios um six-man titles uh, for ring of honor essentially trios uh, the AEW is a trios he's then striking the ring post and then a table with a steel chair, even knocking an employee's hat off of their head uh, ringside. So he was obviously not happy, making it a little comedic at the end there. And so that's not the last you're going to see of the Young Bucks and uh, the frustration that they have uh, for quite a few reasons, uh, especially Matt Jackson was the one of the two Young Bucks, not so much Nick, but Matt is the uh, spokesperson as to why he's feeling the way he feels. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. So now we're back to seeing MJF backstage. He couldn't get himself to knock on Samoa Joe's door. Again, you know, just the flashbacks of uh, the gruesome battle they had, even though he got the upper hand. He just can't see uh, himself becoming friends with Joe and making that happen, trusting the whole situation. And I get it, right? He then moves on to Darby Allen's door. He then chuckles, takes the sign down, and scratches his name out with a Sharpie. He replaces it with Emo Bitch and then runs into the acclaimed again 
and yet again he ignores them. So the I got to give the acclaim credit, namely Max Caster, uh, that he doesn't take no for an answer. And we'll find out later in the show, especially in the main event spot, as to why that was the case. So here we have Adam Copeland in ring with Tony Schiavone for an interview segment. Copeland says, if we knew all the hats Tony wears backstage, we'd cheer even harder. And he thanks him. He says, everybody wants answers. What's he going to do? Is he going to team with Sting and Darby Allin at full gear? Uh, shortly after that, you enter Christian Cage alongside Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne, per usual. Cage wants to paint a picture and says he's going to retire Sting at full gear, whether he likes it or not. And Darby has a gimp arm that will never be the same after Christian dumped him onto the stairs at Wrestle Dream last month. He doesn't think he needs to remind Adam of his neck problems, and he'd hate for the fairy tale to turn into a nightmare. He then suggests Copeland back down from him right now. If he knows what's good for him, that is, or else he'll snap his neck and leave him in a wheelchair to live the rest of his undignified life and let his kids wipe the drool from his face. Now, Christian can see that this isn't quite sinking in for Adam Copeland, so he says, how about I give you a preview, per se. Copeland is on top of his game, fights both of them off before Christian gets in the ring, and he's got his best friend cornered, Luchasaurus, with a northern lariat. Nick slides a chair in the ring, a second chair. Christian wants the concerto. Sting is here. Of course, he makes his way out. He takes Wayne out with a backhand. Darby joins him and goes to town on cage as Adam takes out Luchasaurus. Copeland takes Christian out with a spear. He, it was a great spear, by the way, too. He then grabs the mic and says if Cage wants to snap his neck, he'll beat his ass, and it is on. He calls him a stupid son of a bitch and then tells Darby and Sting that if they need a partner at full gear, he's their man. Match is made official, of course, at full gear. And that six-man tag match. We're going to have Christian Cage, Luchasaurus, and Nick Wayne going up against the likes of Sting, Darby Allin, and now Adam Copeland. I'm looking forward to this match. I really am. I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be much better than people uh, would assume. Uh, the age discrepancy is crazy. Sting in his mid-60s. Nick Wayne on the other side of things, what, 18, 19 years old, crazy, of course, Christian and Edge are up there as well, and then you have uh, the younger guys, well, at least Darby's younger, not quite sure how old Luchasaurus is, if we're speaking, uh, if, if we're being real here, he's probably in his late 30s, early 40s, if we're calling him a dinosaur, uh, then he's the oldest one in the ring, older than Sting, um, so that's... That's made official, and another match is added to that full gear card. So we finally get the Tony Khan huge announcement. Huge quotation marks when we say huge announcement here. Uh, that was promoted all over AEW social media, per usual, the last few days. This guy's had more big announcements through the past few years than I've had birthdays. Or none. Landslide. Not even close. Some of them are good. Some of them don't deliver, unfortunately, like this one. But this is an all-timer. So Tony Khan backstage with Nigel McGuinness for this week's big announcement. Now, this was much like the initial all-in announcement uh, back in April where I was there in attendance in Long Island. And um, we kind of had an idea, especially I knew at least when we saw Nigel McGuinness, I said this has something to do with AEW all in London next August the 25th. This isn't big news. We know they're going back to London. They made that known. Uh, what could they really be saying here? So here we have it. TK says it's been a great year for AEW and recounts the highlights of All In this past August. He says all over the world, Christmas, tree Christmas trees will be going up, and he can't think of a greater gift this holiday season than a ticket to All In 2024. He says tickets will be on sale December 1st, but you can sign up right now to get the best tickets early. We know what's going on here. AEW made this announcement back in August, right? Right after they had All In. And WWE, a little over a week ago, announced that in the very same week, again, All In is August 25th, and that WWE made an announcement that they will be in Germany, right? Uh, what's the name of this? It's the Bash in Berlin. So that's taking place August 31st. And I find it quite funny that both of these companies are having international shows uh, less than a week apart from one another. So I do understand Tony Khan trying to get ahead of things, even though he's the first one uh, of the two companies to make this announcement that they'll be returning there. That WWE said, oh, let's do something around, you know, that time or right before Labor Day and such. And so WWE is, you know, throwing their hat in the ring quite literally and trying to get those fans to come over to Germany opposed to doing a, a London. And look, yes, you do have the time to do both. They're a few days away. But still, I feel like a lot of people are going, going to be making that tough decision of, hmm, where should I put my travel money into? You know, should I be going and making that trip to London for all in? Or are we going to a Germany, which is something new for WWE for this uh, bash in Berlin? So anyway, uh, you know, again, Tony Khan trying to get ahead of things with those ticket sales, announcing they're coming out the first and you could sign up early. And, and I get that. That's all good and well. Um, 
But I do beg the question that why was this made to be a huge announcement? It's an announcement nonetheless, uh, but I, I wouldn't really go as far as, as to consider it huge by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's, it's pretty funny that, you know, that, that this was called a huge announcement because it's not, you know, it's a, it's a notable announcement. It's a significant announcement because uh, of course, with WWE making this passion Berlin announcement just last week, then yes, you know, you want to get the go ahead and say, Hey, let's get these tickets so that people make their decision before WWE even goes and offers tickets uh, for bash in Berlin that a lot of these people made up their mind and Hey, look, if if people are going to go to both of these shows, so be it. But at least Tony Khan saying you could buy our tickets first. And then if you want to go to WWE and some people will obviously wait just for that show strictly, but long story short, this was, not huge news news nonetheless so bully ray or bubba ray dudley however you like to refer to him as he tweeted out and look i don't agree with a lot of his takes on stuff i know he can be uh, extreme at some points and i get it but uh, i got to agree with him here and he says in my opinion uh the huge announcement should have been the rick flair signing whether people like the rick flair signing or not it's about the energy drink it's not so much about him being an AEW as an in-ring talent you know he might have wrestle match or two whether it's against sting or i know he's expressed interest in going up against the likes of an mjf or who knows maybe orange cassidy both who have titles by the way so rick flair may be coming for that uh that gold belt anyway I think it would. I do agree with Bully Ray when he does say that at least you know if you're going to gas up a huge signing, at least it's significant somewhat, like it or not. Uh, Ric Flair coming to AEW is huge. It's a huge move. TK in the middle of the ring. Flair, Flair's music then plays. Uh, TK then would offer Rick a contract for AEW. Rick signs that contract on live television. Place erupts. Rick says he is all elite, followed by his woo, and then uh, Bully Ray follows up by saying, "But what do I know?" And so that's a great proposition, great proposal, certainly would have been bigger than what we got about AEW all in ticket sales and stuff. Again, notable, but not to be gassed up to be a huge announcement, not not by any stretch. So uh, Tony Khan, definitely that was not the move to make on that very uh, moment in time uh, on Wednesday night. But uh, if you were going to have a huge announcement, I couldn't agree more with Bully Ray that uh, Ric Flair should have been the one uh, should have been that announcement. Bottom line. So that's pretty much that. Now we're starting off the nine o'clock hour here. Uh, with Daddy Magic and Cool Hand Ange with Jake Hager by his side, all former members of the Jericho Appreciation Society going up against the former leader in Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega, both from Winnipeg, the Golden Jets as they refer to themselves as since Chris Jericho trademarked that name a couple months ago. Uh, We have Don Callis on commentary, which will be notable post-match more so. And uh, here we have Matt Menard, Jericho starting things off. Chris had a big elbow, tag to Omega, suplex. Uh, Kenny Omega now laying in chops on Matt Menard. Tag was made. Jericho knocks Parker over. Overhead elbows. High angle walls of Jericho. Uh, he wants the lion salt, but Menard, but Menard cracks Chris with the bat. Lateral press. Chris kicks out. Uh, Jericho follows it up, and Jericho then hits Angelo Parker with the Judas effect, uh, which led to their victory. Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega win here. On uh, that post-match, this is where it gets quote-unquote juicy, if you want to call it that. Uh, at least till the the end result here. And this is where we got back-to-back disappointments, in my opinion. First, Tony Khan with that, and then with what I'm about to tell you here, if you haven't already, you know, it's been, if you're in the wrestling, no, you already know where where I'm getting at next. So post-match, Don Callis gets on the mic on stage with the Callis family behind him. Uh, He gives them credit for being like cockroaches, hard to get rid of, and maybe they need to take it up a notch. Uh, Maybe it doesn't get finished in a wrestling ring. Maybe it gets finished on the streets. Uh, So if they've got the guts to face them in a street fight in two weeks on Dynamite, uh, step up to the plate, dummies. Jericho then uh, gets on the microphone. He asks what they're going to do about being called dummies. And Omega then says it's bad enough being a dummy. He'd hate to be a stupid head. Uh, I thought he said stupid idiot because as Chris Jericho um, would commonly refer to uh, you know, people on WWE television. So I think maybe he said stupid idiot. So anyway, he says if they want a street fight, they'll accept it, uh, but not alone. And if he's bringing the Callis family along, uh, they have a spot freshly reserved for Kota Ibushi. So Kota Ibushi will be joining the crew. Uh, Don then points out they need another guy, and Kenny asks Chris for ideas. Jericho says Hobbs is a big man. He's a big man, but he has a friend who's even bigger. Not a normal man, but a giant. Is that that moment in time that we said, all right, well... It's not Goldberg, right? It's not Mark Henry. Certainly not Keith Lee, giant. We all know who the giant was in WCW. That was none other than Paul White. That's the big show. Then shortly thereafter, uh, well, Paul White, he's here. He then knocks out Kyle Fletcher. Uh, Shortly thereafter, there you have it. It looked like he was going to tumble over. It looked like the knees were ready to buckle. Uh, Not being funny, just that's the bottom line of of what we saw out there. So I believe this is going to be... 
uh, Paul White's second wrestling appearance with AEW when he joined the company at some time in 2021. I feel as if he went up against the likes of maybe QT Marshall. Uh, I want to say that's maybe who he fought in some capacity. He was definitely somebody from his factory or whatever. But, um, yeah, so there you have it. The big show is there. He's going to be the fourth and final member going up against the Don Callis family. Like it or not, folks, uh, talk about two disappointing moments, right? Um, you know, that big announcement, that huge announcement from TK, which was really just about ticket sales or tickets being available. And then we have uh, Paul White showing up. All due respect to Paul White. He's had a great career, WCW, WWE, of course. Uh, he's, he's doing a great job with AEW, color commentary backstage, so on, much like Mark Henry. But I think the bottom line here is that um, nobody wants to see him in a ring at this point in time, right? I, I think that's really what it boils down to. And it's um, it, it's just hard to even see him. Walk. I get it. It's a four-on-four match, eight-man tag. He'll probably have minimal spots. He might, you know, he, he should be putting over powerhouse hops at the end of the day. He shouldn't be dominating the future. Uh, one of your future big men in AEW, that'd be silly. You have already kind of... Uh, you know, got Warlow in an uncertain state. You don't want to do that to Powerhouse Hobbs, too, because those are two guys that WWE, uh, as I've said in the past, would do a phenomenal job, I believe. So now we're backstage in the locker room area. We have Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega. Uh, Renee Paquette interviews Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega with the Young Bucks pacing in the background. So it's the Elite's locker room, essentially. Uh, why else would, you know, the Elite, uh, rather, would the Young Bucks be back there, you know, with Kenny Omega? And then, of course, Chris Jericho is basically a guest in their in their locker room. Uh, which makes sense, because if you think back to earlier in the night when MJF knocked on Kenny Omega's door, right? Who was in there? Chris Jericho. So it all makes sense. Anyway, back to this segment. Jericho talks about how Paul White is his friend and Matt Jackson from the Young Bucks, who's been on a mean streak. He's been on quite the tear ever since they lost those uh, titles earlier in the night. You know, hitting that steel chair up against the table and the ring post and so on. And uh, Matt Jackson, he rolls up. He says he's not mad at Kenny Omega but what's the point of the elite being back together if they're not going to have each other's back? Uh, but there's no heat there. He's mad about Chris Jericho being in their locker room. They trade some trash talk between the two. Kenny says it's an enemy of my enemy kind of situation. And then the Bucks stormed off. So are the young Bucks looking to turn heel yet again? Possibly. Are the elite going to split up? Perhaps. I'm not opposed to that. Uh, you know, it's me. It does not matter whether the young Bucks decide to stay with uh, Kenny Omega and Hangman Adam Page, um, it doesn't matter. You know, is it cool collectively to, to see the elite come out together? Yes, I think it's fantastic. Whether they're cutting a segment backstage, a promo backstage, uh, all coming out at once down the ramp, in the ring at once, having each other's backs uh, against the likes of a Blackpool Combat Club or any other faction, sure, it's great. But when push comes to shove, as far as, you know, talking about feuds and championships and stuff, I could really care less about seeing them in a three-man uh, type of deal, whether it's for those ROH six-man tag belts, AEW trios belts, whether it's with Omega, whether it's with Hangman Adam Page. I really don't care, and I think it suits all members of the Elite, uh, whether they're together as a faction or not, uh, to do their own thing. I want to see the Young Bucks in tag team competition. I want to see Hangman doing his singles thing against the likes of Swerve Strickland, which I'm seeing now, and it's great. And then uh, Kenny Omega. Yeah, he's, he's in a, doing a lot of tag team wrestling lately. Uh, with Chris Jericho and Kota Ibushi and so on, when he's done with this whole tag team scenario type of deal, I want to see Kenny Omega go back to what he's best at, and that's singles wrestling. So I think I think that's the bottom line here. Whatever happened, and I'm saying what's the bottom line a lot. What am I, Stone Cold Steve Austin? I might have to crack a couple of cold ones if I keep this up. Anyway, in short, does not matter to me what happens with the Young Bucks and the whole Elite situation. Interesting, to say the least, but it doesn't matter as far as whatever the end result ends up being now by this point in the show it's 9 20. you know what that means it must be time for the women's segment whether it's a segment whether it's a match whenever 9 20 rolls around you know that's when tony khan says ah yes time for a women's match and that's exactly what we got here uh so this women's match was aew women's world champion hikiro shida going up against willow nightingale and then we found out that shida had three title defenses in seven days She's also 14-2 and two in her last 16 singles matches. Very impressive. Now look, Willow Nightingale recently lost the number one contender's fatal four-way match last week on Rampage that involved herself, Sky Blue, Anna Jay, and Abaddon. Uh, now the winner would then wrestle uh, Hikiro Shida on the following night's episode of AEW's Saturday Night Collision. Uh, long story short, the winner of that fatal four-way was Abaddon, who we hadn't seen in a TV match, by the way, in the better part of two years. So... It's good to see her, I suppose. It's me. I could take it or leave it, really. Uh, but then, you know, so all that being said, Abaddon won that title opportunity. Obviously, she didn't 
uh, win the match on Saturday night against Akira Shida at Collision. And so just a few days later, even though she did not win that Fatal 4-Way, then you give a title match to Willow Nightingale. And look, I, I love Willow Nightingale. She's great. But why is she suddenly getting a title match? Is this a runners-up tournament uh, that we had? Was it the other three women that did not defeat Abaddon are eventually going to get a title shot anyways? Anna J next, the Sky Blue next. So what's really going on with that? I don't understand. But anyway, uh, jumping right into this one here. We had Willow Nightingale uh, with an Inziguri running hip attack in the corner. Lariat follows it up. Big boot connects. Whip across. Big spine buster cover to no avail. Trading forearms in the middle of the ring. Willow knocks her down and hits a drop kick off the second rope. Uh, Champ pops back up. Missile drop kick connects. Both women are down and out. Sheeta goes up top. Nightingale meets her. Jockeying for position. Avalanche Falcon Arrow only gets a one count on that one. A big overhand chop gets a few forearms. Then we end up getting a Death Valley driver. Sheeta kicks out. Trading pins. Uh, pump knee from the champ. Nightingale kicks out. Hakiro lines her up. Hakiro Shida then wins with her signature katana, retaining her AEW Women's World Championship. Again, very impressive. Uh, three title defenses within the week. So that's pretty good stuff there. Now, post-match, Tony Storm and her butler, Luther. I think he goes by the name of Luther now. They dropped the ER, added an A for whatever reason on their official uh, roster. Um, so they make their entrance. Hakira Shida then goes up to the top of the ramp, smacks the pillow out of Luther's hand, and then rushes the stage, laying Storm out with the knee and chasing her to the back. The, the knee actually looked vicious. Um, so that was pretty much it as far as they were concerned. Then uh, the lights go out, commentary's confused, as most of us fans were, going from a match to a post-match attack to now not going to the next segment officially. Now the lights went out. Was this a mistake? Clearly it wasn't. Uh, so everybody didn't know what was going on here. Then we see Julia Hart, who's in the ring, uh, with Willow Nightingale. Hart then extends her hand. Willow jaws at her. Sky Blue slides in the ring, gets between the two of them. Now, I thought for certain uh, this was the moment in time we would finally get to see Sky Blue turn heel. Uh, I guess it would be on Willow Nightingale, right? Potentially even join forces with Julia Hart. Uh, but that was not the case. She's staring at Julia Hart, turns around to Willow Nightingale, turns back to Julia Hart, spits blue mist in her face, and we know Julia Hart's been spitting the black mist uh, for the better part of a year now. She did it to both Sky Blue and Willow Nightingale about a month or, month or so ago, which has led to this uh, darker demeanor, darker character for Sky Blue as to why we all thought she's going to turn heel. And with her eye makeup and everything, just her personality in general, and that, that was not the case. So what was the whole point of, of doing this? Uh, when Sky Blue seemingly is going to be a babyface, sided with the babyfaces uh, when all this was said and done, going up against Julia Hart, protecting Willow Nightingale. Um, so look, I'm okay with the end result, but why did it take four or five, six weeks for her to decide, like, hey, like, I, this is what I want to do. I decided I want to remain, um, you know, on the babyface side of things, not the heel. I was kind of intrigued by the fact of her maybe even either joining, um, you know, the House of Black or aligning herself with Julia Hart in some capacity, those two maybe even being a tag team going forward. Thought it'd be pretty cool, but uh, that looks like that's not the case now. Uh, so Julia Hart staggered out of the ring, angry, confused, vowing the curse, Sky Blue. And uh, again, very surprised at what happened here, um, assuming it's going to lead to a feud between Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Um, I'm here for it. They We've seen their match numerous times, I feel. And you know, they are the future of the company, as long as they stay there, of course. They're both very young. Sky Blue, just a couple of years older. I want to say she's 23, 24, and Julia Hart, again, 21, 22 or so. So, um, you know, homegrown with the company, and they've improved each and every year. So now we're backstage with MJF yet again. He's sitting with his clipboard when the acclaimed then roll up. Anthony Bowen says Max Caster is the only guy who likes him, and Caster has a trash bag with an outfit in it that MJF would have to wear for their match. Uh, but MJF takes it and says, uh, no way, you know, I'm not doing this. He's never going to tag with him, and he's got one more group on his list. Uh, we then suddenly pan over to the group of Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, Sanjay Dutt, and Karen Jarrett, uh, encouraging MJF to join them. And uh, MJF reluctantly looked at the trash bag uh, as if he's going to say, well, if these are my two choices, then seemingly it looks like I'm going to have to side with the acclaimed when all is said and done. That's exactly what ended up happening. Not to spoil things if you didn't see Dynamite by now. And so obviously we'll get to that later. Uh, that's actually coming up pretty soon outside of this next segment I'm going to talk about uh, for the main event matchup. So now Renee Paquette is backstage when Roderick Strong and the Kingdom roll up. Uh, they have a ringing phone in hand. 
And they're calling Adam Cole. Strong is upset that MJF didn't even try to ask them to team up with him. And Cole tells him to shut the hell up. So uh, Cole is pretty sick of uh, Roderick Strong's tactics and uh, the kingdom as a whole. And trying to, you know, help MJF out. And he totally sympathizes with MJF that he has to deal with the, the kingdom and Roderick Strong week after week. But this whole next strong gimmick, although it is it, it is growing on me. I thought initially it was just stupid. Uh, but it, it has become... I've gotten maybe I'm just getting used to it, seeing it week after week. This this comedic act of them. Uh, so and Roderick Strong isn't as bad as I thought he was as far as comedy and on the microphone goes. I always knew he was a great wrestler in his NXT days and stuff. But uh, this is this is growing on me for better or for worse. So anyway, main event time: Bullet Club Gold going up against MJF and the Acclaimed. Uh, now look, it was nice to see they put Billy Gunn in the main event of AEW Dynamite, for those that don't know, it was uh, Billy Gunn's 60th birthday this past Wednesday. So happy belated birthday to badass Billy Gunn, or now he's daddy-ass Billy Gunn. Uh, so that was kind of cool. And also to see him go up uh, against his sons, Colton and Austin Gunn. Obviously, the Guns are members of Bullet Club Gold with Juice Robinson and Jay White. Uh, so that whole family dynamic got to share a little birthday party of sorts in the main event of AEW Dynamite. I gotta say this, uh, whatever this ring gear was in the trash bag from the Acclaim that was gifted to MJF, I guess you could call it that, uh, during that previous segment, ended up being pretty cool looking. I, I did like to see this, it looked good on him. MJF came out in a pink Burberry scarf, uh, black scissor me t-shirt, all pink ring gear provided by the Acclaimed, and I gotta say, I love this next reference that Taz mentioned, and if you're not an 80s, 90s baby, early 90s baby, you don't know, or you didn't catch it, in my opinion. Uh, Taz said that MJF, he's dressed like the model, alluding to the model Rick Martel uh, from the WWF Golden Era days, so I did love that. Uh, they then plugged AEW World's End uh, during MJF's entrance, obviously, that it's be taking place at um, uh, the Nassau Coliseum on December 30th, and uh, tickets actually just went on sale um, Friday morning, uh, if you're interested in going to that show. So, of course, they're going to plug that, being MJF's, uh, you know, hometown, AEW World Champion, at least. So they still hope for the foreseeable future. I'm sure he'll be champion going into World's End. And so um, MJF and Juice Robinson start, uh, but Max wants Jay White. Juice obliges, but Switchblade immediately backs off, tags Juice back in. Uh, then we see a tag to Anthony Bowens, circling Robinson, uh, knocks, uh, takes him over. Anthony with a kick combo, leapfrog, bulldog, elbows, and forearms. Uh, super kick takes Juice off his feet. Then we see a tag to Austin Gunn. We see a tag to Daddy Ass. Uh, Billy Gunn with a side headlock, arm drag blocked, off the ropes. Austin ducks a lariat. Then we see Austin Gunn with some jabs, but Billy takes him out with a hard right hand. Uh, taking Colton out, too. Took a uh, two-for-one special, taking both of his sons out. Uh, crotch chopping at his own children. Austin tags Jay White in. Now White with kicks, crotch chops, he goes for a normal chop, and Gunn takes him out with one of his own. So now he tags in MJF at this point, uh, but Jay runs away. The acclaimed wants a scissor, but MJF isn't having it. Now Anthony Bowens was stuck in the corner of the opposition. Bullet Club Gold beating him up pretty handily. Uh, I might add, tag to Daddy Ass, double whip on Colton Gunn, they scissor into an elbow drop. See Scissor Me Timbers to follow. Uh, Max almost relents, you know, scissoring, but then the match breaks down. Caster, he's in a bad way at this moment in time. Colton putting boots to him. Uh, Jay White gets a near fall. Brawling on the floor, chaos ensues. Billy Gunn gets uh, posted face first on his birthday. What the hell's that about? Uh, Switchblade with mocking scissors for Platinum Max. Float over, land on his feet, duck under, tag to MJF. Uh, he was cleaning house on Juice Robinson and the Ass Boys. Uh, we then get a kangaroo kick. Uh, laying out Juice Robinson in one of the guns. I forget which one it was. Uh, Switchblade slides in behind him. Blade Runner, Bullet Club Gold gets the win. And I know a lot of people had a lot to say about this because it was only one Blade Runner that took MJF out, and it was clean. In the center of that ring, uh, he gets the victory over the AEW World Champion. Granted, it was in a tag team match, and I get it. They're trying to give it, uh, Jay White that needed momentum going into this match at full gear in a few weeks' time against uh, said champion MJF, but... I mean, damn, how many more ways can you disrespect MJF? You've been holding his title, quite literally, physically, for the last few weeks, as if it's his very own. It looks good with it, by the way, too. I, I can't wait to see uh, Jay White win the AEW World Championship. It's, I don't believe it's going to be this first go-round against MJF, but uh, sometime in 2024 or 2025, I'd love to see gold around the waist of Switchblade Jay White, namely this AEW World Championship, nothing else. Even though the International Championship is a very pretty title, uh, he needs to be uh, at the very top with this title for sure. But again, he's been holding this title for a few weeks, keeping it from MJF, and now he pins him in the ring clean. So again, a lot of people uh, were not happy about that, and I understand. I, I totally get it. 
Uh, it's not the best of ideas. I feel like this could have went way different um, with that team still losing. Uh, just don't pin Billy Gunn either, right? It's his birthday. But either way, in all sincerity, uh, I was surprised to see that. But post match here, we got Bullet Club Gold standing tall together uh, afterwards and go to attack MJF, but the acclaimed have his back, of course. Uh, White has MJF alone in the ring, lying in wait with the title in hand. Uh, but Max Caster, uh, pun intended, takes the bullet uh, for uh, his buddy MJF. He takes that bullet by getting hit with that title. And uh, Bullet Club, again, they stand tall as MJF goes to check on Max Caster's well-being, and so does uh, Daddy S and Anthony Bowens. And he draws the line at scissoring. But this led to a great moment at the end of the show. Uh, Daddy S gets in the face of MJF very aggressively, too about leaving Max Caster hanging, saying, after all that he's done for you, you're going to scissor him. He may or may not have dropped an F-bomb in the process. He did. Um, but that was great to see. Four-way scissors to end the show, and I get it. The crowd goes home happy after an unfortunate loss. Get to celebrate again Billy Gunn's 60th birthday. All is well and good. Uh, but again, the bottom line is MJF, not only was he on the losing side of things, he was the one who got pinned. And now they're doing the whole celebrating and stuff. And I'm not saying, look, you know, keep a positive spin on things. I get it. Have fun. They finally decided to do the scissoring thing because Billy Gunn got in MJF's face. That's great. But again, you know, what, what are we doing here with MJF? I mean, I, I know he's been very protected throughout the, the, his whole tenure with AEW really. And uh, if you hear that noise in the background, which you may not, it sounds like uh, my daughter is upstairs uh, working on her elbow drop or snap suplex. Either keep it up, Riley. Uh, but anyway, um, that's that's how I should end every show, right? But anyway, they really need to do a good job or a better job of uh, you know protecting MJF in the sense of you know how are you gonna t- have him take a pin clean? I could see you know if, if one of the ass boys or Juice Robinson you know hit him, uh, Juice Robinson hits him with his twenty five dollar TJ Maxx ring, or one of the ass boys end up hitting MJF with his world title, and then Jay White uh, you know pins him, and it could still be after a finishing maneuver, right? Uh, so I really don't know what that's all about. Um, you know, after a Blade Runner, you can still get hit with the Blade Runner and then also, you know, get hit with the title and it would have been a little more justified as to why he got pinned after one Blade Runner. So that is left to be desired about that creative, uh, you know, idea, but that's what took place. Overall, the show definitely wasn't one of their better ones. I feel like the last time I was on here for AEW Dynamite review uh, last week, I want to say I I said that was in the, the top 10 of Dynamites throughout the course of 2023. This certainly was far from it. Um... But from creative decisions, uh, bringing in Paul White to have an MJF lose clean to TK saying he has a huge announcement that really wasn't, uh, to finding out the next day that Ric Flair is signing with AEW, which probably should have been the huge announcement, like it or not. The name Ric Flair is big. Again, we're not signing him to be in ring, at least hopefully not. Uh, they signed him for that Woo Energy drink and, of course, a whole list, I'm sure, of other uh, help backstage and promotional use. I mean, you, you put Ric Flair on your AEW product, um, you know, like it or not, uh, he's gonna he's gonna help the company. He's gonna he's gonna draw eyes to the product. How many? I don't know. Because again, he's not wrestling. But uh, to see himself aligned with the company, I'm really curious. I'm even curious about the future too. Of course, his son-in-law Andrade working there, and I'm wondering if uh, Andrade is gonna re-sign with AEW. And hey, look, maybe it's not totally out of the realm of possibility that one day, you know, his daughter Charlotte Flair could end up in AEW at some point in time. Maybe when she's just you know, over the whole WWE run and stuff like that. Maybe she just gets a little bored. Maybe she signs a couple year deal with AEW and uh, I would love to see the ring name there, right? It wouldn't be Charlotte Flair. Would it be uh, her actual name? Would it be Ashley Flair? Uh, So that remains to be seen. So that'd be pretty interesting to see her mixed up with some of the AEW talent and so on. So folks, that just about does it here for my AEW Dynamite review for November 1st. Uh, again, I thank all of you for tuning in to the Turnbuckle Topics podcast. Truly appreciate it. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening.